Welcome to another TMG interview, everybody. My name is Paul Preston, chatting it up with uh, another filmmaker for the TMG interview. He's an actor who has now directed his second feature film, and it's available all over video on demand platforms as of June 4th. The film is Roadhead, and the director is David Del Rio, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Paul. Uh, of course. Now, let me begin by saying uh, I saw this movie, and you're a sick son of a bitch. <laughs> thank you thanks so much <laughs> you're a sick bastard del rio yeah, uh, but, yeah. uh now that it's uh now that that's out there let's go ahead and tell everybody what i always like the filmmaker to describe the movie because it may they may bring up elements yeah. that i that they want focused on that i may not so go ahead and tell everybody what is roadhead and i know so, you giggle mm -hmm. every time probably somebody asks you that, <laughs> as i as i did saying it Part of, part of, part of the uh, fun of, you know, kind of directing a movie with this type of title was to have conversations like this, but, you know, you kind of forget about it. And, and then the, the movie comes out. And now that the movies come out, just constantly talking about Roadhead is something that I, that I never <laughs> expected it, it, my, uh, to spend a week in New York talking about. Um, uh, I mean, also in the middle of my family reunion. Um, no. So basically what Roadhead is about is uh, three friends decide to go on a, uh, you know, your usual uh, road trip and uh, they come across a medieval executioner whose sole purpose is to chop heads off and uh, collect them and sacrifice and, and put them, uh, uh, <laughs> put them on a, on a mantle. And, you know, it's also a story about friends who are friends by default uh, that are put in a situation that they have to survive together. And that sort of angle was, a was what I was most interested in. Um, and it was what really hooked me to kind of want to, you know, dive into a kind of ridiculous bonkers premise and find the human story in it and, and, and try to take it out of, of that sort of, you know, that sort of uh, playbook. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, you left out the really crazy, gory, lunatic parts of the movie, but those would be spoilers. So you <laughs> exactly for what you're talking about. But then just trust me, it gets pretty crazy. Um, oh. But the real sicko here, no doubt, is the writer, right? Like, what's wrong with the writer that they would come up with this crazy story? Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's funny too, right? Because I, I, I had a, I had, uh, I had some drinks with a uh, producer friend of mine, and he's, you know, produced. Uh, yeah. He produced me in a project and he's produced like films like La La Land and Hotel Artemis. And he told me what my next project was. And I was really embarrassed to, to say it. And I was like, I, well, I'm directing like my second feature. And, and he goes, what's it called? And I said, you know, it's called Roadhead. And he goes, Roadhead. Huh. Sounds fun. And he goes, so, uh, so have fun with it. And that little advice kind of changed the, my course of, of judgment on a piece like that, where I said, okay, let's all have fun with how ridiculous and sick this is. Because the more fun we have on set, I think it's going to sort of come off on the screen of, of, of you know, just based on how much fun we had. And, and then hopefully people will have fun watching it as well. And uh, I think, you know, from based on the, uh, you know, the, the feedback we've been getting and, and the fans that have kind of been <laughs> reaching me, reaching out to me on DM and, and kind of asking me weird, weird, weird ass questions. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's been, it's, it, you can tell that the audience was kind of having fun with it as well and, and found that, that we weren't really taking it as serious, you know? Um, and, and, and so I think that, you know, I think Chloe had a, a, a real great sense of fun writing it as well. And, you know, we used it as a blueprint to just continue to find what the human story was. And so that's where, uh, um, that's where uh, we kind of married the, okay, let me get my judgment out of this script. Let me get my own personal taste out of this script and kind of come at it in a way that I feel like an audience member would have a great time watching it as well. Yeah, I mean, there's 
tension when you need the scenes to be suspenseful, but then clearly you're poking fun at these uh, crazy cults that show up in movies like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And mm -hmm. so how do you find that on the set? You, you, you say this is your directorial vision. I think you achieved it. The movie's loose, fun, and weird throughout. Yeah, yeah. And you, but Thanks. how do you achieve that on set is with the direction of the actors and with making sure that, you know, the music kind of comes in and does the same, achieves those same sort of balance and tones? I always, I always find that every stage of filmmaking is a different, um, it's a different draft of the script right so you got your draft and then you're on set and you're kind of feeling the vibe and you're kind of feeling tension or you're kind of feeling people are need be hydrated <laughs> and then you also kind of find that the actors are coming in with their own ideas and their own perspectives and point of views and then you're on the cutting room floor you know every sort of stage of the uh, of the process is, is 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 a new draft and so when you're on set I really wanted to give a real festive uh, environment. And I, what I would always tell my crew was um, let's not forget what it was like for us being 14 year old kids who wanted to make movies. So let's kind of tap into that and, and let's not take this so seriously uh, because it's not, <laughs> it just isn't right. We, we can take the work seriously, but not ourselves. And, and, and the moment we kind of start doing that, then we kind of forget how fun filmmaking can be. And so with the actors, I try to kind of say, this is weird. This is bonkers, right? This is, yeah, but this is fun though. So, so I, I kind of really wanted to tap that into, in, in, onto the film set. And, and we had a great time considering that even when we surpassed our half our body weight or our full body weight of hydration, we still needed water. And so despite that, uh, uh, you know, we kind of had a, a really fun time. Yeah, I got to follow up on that because most indie films, you can tell they're indie films because they're all shot in the white walled L.A. apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you mm -hmm. got out of there and went to a dry lake or what could look like maybe salt flats even, even though it was in the yeah. first dry lake. So um, what challenges were to shoot that? I mean, clearly it sounds like the weather was just uh, insane. Do you even need permits out there? I go to Vegas and I'm driving to Vegas. I, I look off to them right and you go, you know, we drive a mile that way with a camera. Who the hell's going to, we just start shooting. No one's going to know. Where's the, who's you, you, running that? You, what was fascinating was, was that it was, acres upon hundreds of acres upon hundreds of acres of land of, of, of a white sand uh, desert and um and what was interesting is that where we shot actually was owned was an owned part of one of the owners of just uh, a specific acre you know uh, limit you know and, and that and what was fascinating was there's no street or there's no like sort of road lines to guide you of where you need to go so this guy we're following this guy who owns a part of that of the dry lake bed and all of a sudden he's driving forward and then he has to take this right just in the middle of nowhere and and when we would pass a little by him we weren't allowed to kind of just free drive around and just park anywhere and so this guy had to memorize or you know this guy knows where the limits are but we got lost all the time and it, and when we would pass the line that that we were supposed to shoot onto somebody all of a sudden we're on someone else's property mm -hmm. and then he would say you need to be careful with that because people come in and do like you know figure eights with their cars and you know all that stuff and and so you know you, they might think that you're doing the same thing and there's a lot of people who own guns and 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 will probably shoot at you if you cross a certain part and i'm like well well how do i know which part like you know like we, and they we run a, a call set of equipment yeah and they'll drag you into <laughs> right right and so <laughs> and so basically that was pretty that was pretty interesting for us too and and you know the thing is is that what i found interesting was i like um fighting elements of storytelling uh with sort of different things that i've seen before so for example the question that we kept coming up with is out in the open there is still a chance for someone to sneak up on you 
even though you have a 360 around you, you know, you, you would still get surprised by who might be following you. And I found that very interesting as opposed to like, you know, you're in one road, like, for example, like, you know, Tom Ford's you know, like nocturnal animals, right? The thing that mm-hmm. bothered me about that movie. And by the way, I loved that movie, but one of the things that bothered me was the fact that I'm like, I would, I, I would totally get away from those guys who were trying to get me off the road. You know what I mean? I'd go right. I'd go left. I'd do a U-turn. I mean, like, I got my kids in the car, you know, like there's, there's, there, there, like, I would not be intimidated by, you know, by these people. And what that was, what was fascinating to me in terms of being the dry lake bed, we are such in an open space here. Of course we would see something a mile away, but then the questions we ask ourselves is, can we? And I, I found that pretty interesting. Well, points to Ryan Verbell or Verbal? Uh, Verbell. Verbell, your yeah. cinematographer. Yeah, the, yeah, one, yeah. The, the landscape shots of the desert look fantastic, especially the sky. You know, here's some high praise comparing Roadhead to Lawrence of Arabia. But you know that classic shot with uh, yeah. Omar yeah. Sharif and he's about this big and then he gets closer and closer. It's mostly totally. just landscape and he's tiny. That's one of your first shots of uh, the executioner um, coming yeah. on, coming up to our protagonists. Yeah, you know, something about Ryan's sense of leadership on the set is he has this attitude of he does not have to be above a certain voice level <laughs> to to kind of command of what he wants on the frame, you know? He's got this sort of throwaway, laxed I, uh, uh, approach with leading his leading his team to get the shot that I needed. And, and, and he's got just such this, such this cool way of, of just being a leader and making sure that everybody's uh, uh, respects their roles. And also, um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be intense to be authoritative. And I, and I kind of take that uh, uh, from him too, because, you know, as a director, you know, it's, it's sometimes I feel like it's a little bit of a, um, an easy cop out type of job where it's just like, I'm going to tell you my vision, but then he knows physically how to do it, you know, and I'm just the poet and he's the guy who kind of can physically kind of just, Oh, I know what you want. Can you bring that? And then he starts saying all these like uh, technical terms and stuff like that. So I've kind of just been trying to brush up on my technical glossary ever since uh, working on roadhead. And it's kind of been really helping, uh, help, helping me out uh, in the long run, but you know, Verbell, really is is a dp that i'll i'll work with every one of my films if 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 i have the chance to uh you know get hired again to direct another one mel brooks i think was in his 80s when the producers hit broadway right or Mm. or at least late 70s so never too late to to you know or you never have to understand these technical terms because what i heard about that movie was a song like that face he just kind of went here's what we want and then mark shaman would be like write down i think it was shaman right? totally. would write down the, the notes and all the technical mm-hmm. jargon he just knew we wanted to go da, 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 you know so there you go that's how yeah. artists might work sometimes you can do that it's before. true yeah, it's true. It's true. I, if you can continue giving me these these little, uh, uh, you know, I love, you know, me. I mean, listen, you're my arch nemesis in the Schmodown. So, you know, <laughs> uh, love. Uh, I love those. Uh, I love those tidbits. I love those things. But it, but it, but it's true though. You know what I mean? But I do think there's also a sense of if you if you're a director and you say, do you want this or you don't want this, and you kind of say, and you use your words wisely in saying. I don't care. Like either one works, right? It's, it's a a separation of, of really being married to your vision. And then also um, being a director that says, well, the reason why I kind of get that director credit is not because all the ideas are mine. It's because they're the decisions that I've made from the ideas coming to me. You know, and, 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 and I think that was, that's one of those things where you kind of really need to know yourself and, and know that your vision doesn't always have to be coming from you, but it's inspired from other people's ideas. And, and I think that's, that, that happened a lot uh, uh, in Roadhead too. Well, and the, uh, the other thing about, you know, going back to like shooting in an open space is like, 
continuity was a dream because it was almost like you really have to watch the movie to know that if we turned the camera around or kind of put it in a, in a, in a you know, like we didn't, we had no problem finding locations because we're like, oh, okay, this next scene, they're supposed to be like 10 miles away from where they last were. Great. So let's just pan the camera to the left. And <laughs> now we got these mountains and this sky. And, you know, that, so that, that really helped as well. So that was really great to work with Ryan as well, where it's like, you know, where do we want to shoot that in a place that we haven't and, and not feel like we've shot there before was, was so fun trying to find. And it wasn't that hard. Until you come across this like car graveyard of sorts. And it's got like, it's yeah, beautiful, I mean, beautiful hundreds of automobiles or something in it and it, mm -hmm. that's where our creepy cult lives well, where's mm -hmm. that what is that because you don't have a bunch of cars sitting around david del rio where, where yeah are you this? Uh, well so i was in so we shot this in barstow california and um we uh you know this this was also a this was also a shoot and, and a script that was inspired by locations and so, and so, you know, John Paul Burkhart and uh, Chloe, the, 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 the screenwriter came, uh, went to, uh, uh, just went to Barstow and just looked for a lot of these places and just found this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, junkyard with all this piled up automobiles. And I looked at it and I go, that this has got to be where, um, uh, where the climax is. This has got to be where the rest of the ending of the movie is. And, uh, um, we found it really interesting to be in such an open space and then to be in such mm -hmm. a closed space, um, such as that junkyard it was something that was a, a real juxtaposition that I was really excited to share. Well, let's get to the cast. Uh, we have Damian yep. Joseph Quinn, Elizabeth Grillon, Grillon, mm -hmm. Grillon. Oh, the, the double L, Grillon. Yeah. And Clayton Ferris as our trio, uh, Damian and Clayton, the gay couple, and Elizabeth, the mm -hmm. straight woman traveling with them, who's just come off a horrible relationship. Right. Um, solid leads. I got to say, Clayton worked with my uh, late wife on a project that shall not be named, so I've seen his work mm. before. But yeah. uh, and I will honor him by again not mentioning that, that project. We, <laughs> we all have those in our bag of tricks as an actor. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you see that person you work with them on, and you're like, yeah, we did that. Uh, you and I, we yeah, shared yeah. the thing that we we worked on that thing. <laughs> yeah, we worked on that thing. Yeah, yeah. Shall yeah. not be named. Yeah. Um, Bringing them on yeah, board. They, how was they, that process? That was uh, you know, casting is my favorite part. You know, uh, as an actor myself, uh, I tried to establish a room to allow the actors to kind of be free and, and to bring in their ideas. You know what I mean? Not interested in kind of telling them, all right, here's here's exactly the way that I see it. You know, I just kind of give them a real broad feeling of what I, how I want these characters uh, uh, represented. And Damien, uh, you know, it was between Damien and another guy, and I've told Damien this already, but like so, so happy with his performance and, and him and I are really good friends, but you know, uh, there was just another guy that I was fighting for. I was just fighting for this other guy. And the other producers were just like, David, Damien's the one. And I said, okay, great. Uh, I mean, like either would be great, you know, but Damien really, really brought it. And, uh, and I'm so proud of his work. Um, I've known Clayton for a couple of years through John Paul Burkhart, the producer. Um, and so it was nice to finally uh, uh, work with him. And he just brought so much charm uh, and so many ideas. You know, you know, this script was we felt like we were, you know, staff writing on a TV series, you know, like we, it felt like we were at like writing for SNL and we were about to, you know, give out a, a sketch in the last minute. Um, you know, a lot of rewrites came in and these actors really immersed themselves in saying, this is what I think my character would say. And then we would say, okay, when, when your character would say this, Clayton, then what's going to happen on page something right and so we would all really be investigating this, uh the script and so clayton brought a lot of great ideas actually it was his idea and i think he said it as a joke but i also think he knew what the hell he was doing to kind of just get more screen time but uh at the end there you know he he you see clayton a little bit more uh, on screen on the uh in the in the third act um you know that was totally his idea 
He was like, oh, that'd be cool. And I go, yeah, that would be cool. And then it was like his last day of shooting. And I go, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, that really would be cool. Yeah, let's let's bring that in because also is a great uh, uh, marriage of plot points of what was happening with you know Elizabeth's uh, Elizabeth's character as well um, in terms of 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 how to get over a loved one, you know, um, or, or you know, a breakup or whatever. Um, and then Elizabeth and I uh, knew each other from acting class. And when I was reading the when I was reading uh, the script, I thought of her and I thought of her only. And so we kind of brought her in and I said, guys, this is the one I'm, uh, I, I want you to see her interpretation. And uh, they loved it. They loved it. And, and she really brought great strength to the character that I that I really, really appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, if she's the scream queen of this movie. Uh, it's yeah, totally. totally different than you've ever seen before because the scream could be like, ah, I'm in trouble. Like, from the get go, her character is like <laughs> swear, like swearing and it's telling this guy to screw off. And they, like, she has no time for the villain. I mean, she's scared for a second, but a lot of the times is like cussing out the villain, telling him to go, <laughs> tell him where he can go. Yeah. And it's pretty funny. And you know, I think, I think it, I, I feel like it worked only because you know, we had to establish something that was going on in her life that you know, that if a threat would come, she would kind of feel like, well, what else can happen in my life at this point? You know what I mean? Like this, is, I'm, I'm just so over it. And, um, you know, but I also told her, you know, we also talked about that, you know, with Stephanie, her character, you know, this is a real defense mechanism for her. This is how she's survived, you know? And then uh, how sort of, uh, as you said, like the sort of, uncaring and lax toward and, and unfeared towards the the main antagonist of the film you know we started talking about like well what else has she seen in her life you know and we kind of really really dug in with with that character work too and really elizabeth really brought in a lot of backstory that we didn't have to share but she brought in a lot of backstory of what uh, uh, Stephanie has gone through her life, which I really, really appreciated her work. And then, obviously, all three of their uh, all three of their chemistry was just uh, I just point and shoot and mm -hmm. have them speak and have them chill, you know. And, and they and you know they they established a camaraderie out, outside of set, which I appreciated as well. And and I, I think they really delivered on this film, and I'm very happy and very proud of their work. Uh, well, last question about Roadhead, obviously would be uh, remiss to ask if I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, did the pandemic affect post a festival run, any part of the production? Um, the festival run, um, we were at Cinequest uh, in oh, San Jose. No yeah. Yeah. yeah in, in, in San Jose. And the day after is when the whole world sort of shut down. So we had a premiere and then that's when we kind of know, but, nothing was affected on uh, uh on film however i did post with brian rodriguez a fantastic editor um i kind of got into the whole zoom thing before the pandemic hit i did the whole post production through zoom wow and that was in, and that was in 20 that was in 2019 as well. And so I was in Europe at the time. And then I was also kind of like traveling and, and I didn't have, I was living out of a suitcase. And, and so I did, I did all of it uh, through, through post. And that was, that was pretty interesting, especially when the, when the Wi-Fi was lagging, I was like, well, that was an extremely long pause. I think we should, I think we should shorten that pause. And he's like, Oh no, it's, it's, just, it's your yeah. Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's your Wi-Fi. So, um, but get a house, but, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, to kind of wrap, you know, to kind of see timing, you know, like timing is so important. So to you have to be there uh, in post, uh, wow. in person. So yeah. so that you know to really see timing and to try to get the timing and to really um, tell the you know tell Brian you know the editor see what else you can find you know, gotta say, to kind of, you let it make you know. a lot of choices i imagine right just make some choices we did we did yeah. constant constant choices i mean we moved i mean paul like i said the, 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 that was the last draft of the screenplay we moved scenes that were uh, originally in the beginning to the end i moved lines i moved you know you know the process so you know you 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 
you get to really, really find that, that, you know, uh, that timing, but, but, but working on it <laughs> remotely was fascinating. And, uh, would I recommend it? Not really, but I'm glad, but you know, it wasn't, it was quite an experience. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm never going to do this again. This is not how I'm going to be communicating with people. And now this is exactly how we're communicating. Yeah. Um, but it was fascinating. It really was a, a fascinating experience. You got to see one screening with an audience, right? That's in a quest that was a full audience. So you got to see the reaction at least once. Well, full, not really, uh, but, yeah, still it, but, but yeah, 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 yeah. But, but it was, um, it was nice because I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've been through this as well, where it's kind of like, oh, I'd never found that funny or, oh, I never <laughs> found that scary or, you know, oh, I'm glad they got scared at that particular point. And, oh, wow, the music sounds good in, in this, you know, surround uh, piece. And, and that was like the first time I'm like, oh, well, this music is actually pretty cool, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so um, and, and so there were a lot of, and then, you know, the, the silences uh, were, were fascinating too, where it's kind of like, yeah, I listen that guys, I know you found that disgusting, but that's, that's okay. And, and just know that I'm there with you. I find it disgusting too. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, what I was interested in is kind of like, you know, and that's my basis in terms of when I direct or even when I, uh, excuse me, when I write is, has this ever been done before? And cinephiles just, uh, as you and I, you know, um, competitive cinephiles, um, is, it, it, you know, that really is, is a, a, a gauge in terms of how you kind of work in filmmaking where it's like what I'm interested in is if this aspect of the scene how can we do it show it say it feel it in a way that our memory bank you know can tell us that we've never seen before and that was kind of something that I was uh, trying to move forward with uh, too and you know you can't really ask these questions really on the budget like the one we shot with Roadhead you know it's just like well what it is what it is we're gonna have to do it and you know but it it's always a good compass and a way to kind of move forward when you're when you're telling stories has this ever been done before uh in and, it, and if so how can we sort of expand on it well you mentioned uh, uh let's get on to the schmodown for a second if folks yeah. don't know what that is the movie trivia schmodown is a movie trivia league tens of thousands of people watch this thing and people who are filmmakers actors pundits bloggers critics mm -hmm. all, of all types who love movies see how much they know and it's become super competitive and you mentioned that we're competitive yeah. but not anymore david we're on the same team they have these we're all yeah we're on the same team baby yeah so we got to get you yeah, in yeah, here off making movies we got to get you in yeah. to play a match or two um <laughs> But uh, I, I thought we played against each other last year, and it was a great scenario. My character on that, because it's like the WWE. There's characters, stories, right. alliances, and my character is super annoying. He's like a bro type who you just <laughs> not want to hang out with. And I just thought our scenario and was And you had your shake. Yeah, you're like shake, your workout yeah, shake. Yeah, protein shakes like everywhere that. I go. <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny because our whole scenario was you were going to play in this uh, one match, the winner gets to play in this big tournament that was coming up. That's right. That's right. In the tournament because of a filming schedule, you were just going to play me. And if you won, I, your win would just be that I don't get to play because I'm annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. You're like, I don't, I don't so even good. want to play. I just want to knock him out because he's obnoxious. Right. <laughs> Right, 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 and, and that was that was a good match. I remember too because you know it, we. It's always it always feels good. I mean, no, it doesn't feel good like when you lose, but it feels good that you get to lose in like in the last question. I like giving. I also like giving people a good show too. You know what I mean? And so we gave a good show that uh, that 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 match. You know, we were in the five the that five question uh, the five point question, five point question. Uh, um yeah and so but you, listen you've been you've been great man i have been watching and and i've been so impressed with oh. just really the, the 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 small detail questions and i was like what i can't believe he, he knew that part and and so that you know i mean it's uh uh it's a competitive it's, it's gotten really competitive there's there's some hungry hungry totally. hungry people yeah. uh, uh ready to win i was that annoying kid asking let's play the movie game and what it was for me was you name two three actors and then you just you just guess the movie and nobody wanted to play with me because you know um 
uh, I always won and I knew that, uh, but, but, you know, I just always wanted it to play and how that cinephilia kind of uh, locked in was um, I went to go watch Barry Levinson's wag the dog when I was about 12 or 13 and why my parents decided to take me to go see a political satire. I, I don't know. I didn't understand anything that was going on. But then, you know, as a kid, you kind of know who Robert De Niro is um, in a way like that the, the world knows who Robert De Niro is. And so I look at the poster and then I just don't know who that other guy is. That shorter, that shorter one. And I was just like, who is that? And then my mom said, that's Captain Hook. And she was talking about Dustin Hoffman. And I was floored just floored I, floored and it wasn't even about acting it was just the just that fact and so then after wag the dog after that screening i went to i went home and back when imdb do you remember when imdb was just a, a website of lists it was just film it was just a filmography it was just filmography that's all it was no, none of none of the database or the analytics that people, you know, that, that the IMDb it is now, but it was just lists. So I just looked at every, every film that Dustin Hoffman made. And then I played six degrees of Kevin Bacon. To, so I went to another actor who worked with him. And so my second actor that I looked in all his movies was John Voight. And then Paul, I can't tell you who the third or the rest were. I just went into a sink wormhole of just looking at lists. And I was hooked. I was just a complete, complete cinephile then. Let's How did you? It, let's just say it was the rest. Right? <laughs> after, yeah. after Void, it was the rest. <laughs> the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you get hooked with like the, with, you know, just knowing knowledge and kind of like studying and all that stuff? Like, how, were you just like a fan and, or, you know? Yeah. Well, what was that? What was that aha moment? I think uh, I wanted to know who was responsible for this good or bad when I would watch a movie. And so I just became an mm -hmm. avid credit reader. You know, I still have trouble mm -hmm. with plot questions sometimes because if I haven't seen a movie, uh, I'm going to struggle with what happened in it. But, you know, a lot of times, mm -hmm. even if a movie comes out and does poorly at the box office, but I didn't see it, I'm like, why did no one see that? Who's, who made this? What's going on? You know, and I would right. just all that stuff, get it all down and then track what they were doing next. You know, if I saw that, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I like this uh, uh, broadcast news or whatever, James L. Brooks. I want to see whatever he's doing next. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you get to him, you're like, oh, well, he made all these TV shows. Oh, he's behind The Simpsons. It's like your head explodes. And so that I'm kind of like you in that respect, but it just was mainly out of who do I blame or <laughs> who is my, who am I a new fan of? And I'm going to follow that. Yeah, totally. Achilles totally. Heel is still bad movies. Mm. In movie trivia showed you asked me a trivia question about a bad movie i might have trouble because i just don't <laughs> yeah. care and i've i've had a, a lifetime of not caring but i've looked at them now and had to study and figure out what's going on with them for the sake of the, the show i have a i have an ocd uh uh way of picking i mean you know you know with all the um the resources that we have now and how to find movies and watch them and stuff like that. You know, it's hard to make a decision of which movie to watch. And I have this real OCD system of which movie to watch uh, next. And it's just basically sort of like all my, I have all my viewing apps, Netflix, Amazon, whatever to be like, I, I try to find resources of where to find of how to watch particular movies and i just kind of put it in alphabetical order and so if i say i started amazon prom and i watched wag the dog it was robert de niro okay who's the next in line in that credit is dustin hoffman great what's the next app alphabetically that is in uh uh Whoa. you know this yeah you know, and then so <laughs> then i type I, i'm telling you it's ocd and then i type dustin hoffman and then those are my choices those are the choices that I have to to see which movie to watch because the thing is is that there are some gems out there, right? That that no one has ever seen, and then there are ones where it's like, wait a minute, I have to tell people how bad this movie is, and and, and no wonder it didn't see the light of day of this or whatever. And then you just never know when a Schmodown question comes, and you're like, whoa, I cannot believe I saw that random movie, and it helped me with that question. 
Yeah, so the Schmodown Live, the guys who put it together, Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis, were a group called the Schmoes No, and they did blogging <clears> and movie reviews, and they still do, but they started the Schmodown. So it's the Schmodown You can find everything you need to know about the league. Go check it out. We're up yeah. there and archived. Uh, episodes of ours are up on their youtube page etc uh, yeah. a couple quick more things and i get to the final final question uh the in the heights movie is coming out i know you did it on broadway Are you excited yeah. i'm I, I there, reviews are fantastic oh well i mean I, i'm first of all i'm so glad the reviews are are, are fantastic um you know I, I i am very excited you know i think you know i think Lin Manuel miranda is is a storyteller and, and, and is an exciting story, a storyteller, an exciting poet, an exciting uh, um, force in the entertainment industry that he's really getting his, his time in the light in the film side. And, uh, and I'm glad that they uh, took the time and waited this long to, to release the movie, you know, cause you know how people, you know, how things get so popular and they just want to crank them out. You know, uh, uh, and so, you know, In the Heights, you know, I had my own little In the Heights movie experience where I, you know, uh, this was according to the New York Times at the time. So I didn't know if it was official because I actually never got the call. But I, you know, but I will tell you that as a soft fact, not really a really hard fact, but back in 2010, I think, you know, I got cast as the kid that I that I played in the show when Kenny Ortega was was directing the movie and so and so but that was like a guy who should have crossed that project at some point right well that that was a that 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 script was exactly the show and i think this script is what i like about what what's happening with this particular project is you want you want to do adaptations of musicals not as the musical on broadway or not as a musical on stage it's its own entity, right? And so I think I'm very, very excited to see the individual entity that In the Heights is because art is open for, for um, uh, what, what's that word? Interpretation, right? So it's open for interpretation. So a, a piece of art has to be evolutionized, has to be, uh, not, and I'm not even talking about modern. Right. I'm talking about just it needs to, you know, a a piece of art needs to continue to grow and have new veins, new blood, new body. Uh, And so this is not going to be the Broadway show. Right. This is going to be its own entity as a film. And I'm very, very excited and really, really proud of everyone involved in it. And I also saw your name because I produce a podcast called D23 Inside Disney. It's the official Disney podcast. I guess it mm. felt to me like it started out as the fan club podcast, but now it seems to encompass the entire company. Mm. And uh, we were talking about the upcoming slate of ABC shows. And on the, on my podcast, David Del Rio's name comes across <laughs> uh, as this show Maggie seems to be set for a mid-season ABC uh, show. So tell us what to expect when the, what to be looking for when mid-season rolls around with Maggie. Um, so, so I, you know, I think, we, so we start shooting in September, so it might be rolling around, uh, rolling out at the in early spring. Um, but uh, it is a show about a fortune teller who, uh, or uh, a fortune uh, palm reader who meets this guy at a party uh, who I play and reads his uh, palm and sees his future, but sees her uh, uh, in his future, married, family, kids, you know, all that stuff. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a romantic comedy about how a palm reader can really live in the moment. If she knows what the rest can, can you really live in the moment? If you know what the rest of your life is going to look like in the future. So, uh, I'm really excited about it. And, uh, you know, tapping is, you know, kind of like, uh, one of those roles that I've never played before, you know, I've, I've played romantic uh, plot lines and stuff, but uh, to be, you know, the romantic lead, it's, 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 it's a different experience for me, (laughs) but I'm having, but I'm having a lot of fun and, and, you know, um, there's a lot of cute, cute romance, romance in in it. And uh, I'm really excited for the audience to see where these characters go. 
That's cool. No, I haven't heard of that. I mean, again, here you are involved with something that fits your credo, right? It's something that's never yeah. been done before, as far as I know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there's, you know, uh, I've been watching a lot of, I've watched a lot of romantic comedies and, you know, it, there's going to be a lot of things that kind of emulate the when Harry met Sally model that I can't wait for. I cannot wait for the audience to see. Well, I appreciate you chiming in from your family reunion. I, I like the fact that it kind of <laughs> sounds like a press junket, even though I know it's not. But me, you know, right, 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 right. Busy. Paul, I'm so busy. You got me right in the middle of the press, the press junket. I'm, I'm going to so let you busy. go. So I'm going to let you go so you can get to Access Hollywood. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> but before you go, let me ask you what mm -hmm. I ask everyone who, who I talk to in an interview setting. What is your favorite movie of all time? Oh, man. What is it today is how I like to answer. That it. is so, not you know, a bad way to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I got to say, I really do love James Foley's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, I just yeah. think I love, I love single location, multiple people structures and nothing's better than that. Mm -hmm. And these, and, and it's, and it's, and you are watching a heavyweight fight between everybody and and everyone is bringing their a game and yeah. it was it, 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 every i mean yeah the leads yeah <laughs> and and you know and then and then you kind of see everyone's thing too right it was a it was a showcase of everyone's thing right like no one stutters in the middle of their line better than jack lemon Nobody does. Nobody. Yeah, what, I, mean, I mean, what a performance. The, the way, yeah, the way he laughs in the middle of his things and the way he kind of decides to kind of change tactics so he doesn't get told on by, by, um, <laughs> by, you know, that guy. So then, so then, yeah, so then, uh, of course, Pacino, Jonathan Price, um, Alec Baldwin, Ed Harris, Alan Arkin, who's like, he like brings his whole Alan Arkin thing to, <laughs> totally. to the, but it must have been, it must have been, a dream for James Foley to be working with those actors. And, and I think any director would love the chance to be shooting a film in a single home with an ensemble of heavyweights, such as those guys. And remarkably cinematic, considering we just remarkably. talked about how you can't take a musical and just bring it to film. I, I mean, I, I, I don't want, I hate to throw movies under the bus, but I thought Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was a little a little static Play. considering how i thought one night in miami was this like, explosion of cinema and acting and all this stuff so i think that can happen with a play and foley definitely did not you did not feel the claustrophobic feeling unless you were supposed to which you could sometimes mm -hmm. in that movie the guys in the office just needed to get out of the office but well, uh, and, and, and then the other thing the other thing movie. to act and then to add to what you were saying, and again, I don't like to be, I don't like to throw movies under the bus either, but we actually mentioned that too, but like the remake of the producers, right? It was, it really was a shot for shot wanting to do the stage phenomenon. You know what I mean? And saying, well, if it worked on stage, it's going to work on film. That's not, that's not always the case, you know? And so, but I do agree, incredibly, incredibly cinematic. But yeah, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, probably going to change tomorrow when you ask me but, uh, but today that's that's what i'm feeling yeah well that man that is a great one i mean lemon what was his oscar nomination thank god he left the, the world with a win at least for save the tiger but i thought his performance was a heartbreaker in that movie so guy i tell i went in there and i sold him like, <laughs> i mean you know gill from uh, that's basically gill on the uh simpsons mm -hmm. is lemon you know his character yeah uh, so and, yeah so and, and, and the way and and the way of you know to see to see a window of a performance of when he comes in and he is victorious to where he ends up at the end of the film. It's brutal. There's brutal, brutal. <laughs> and it was, and it was a fantastic 20 minute stream of emotional consciousness that was happening there where tactic number one wasn't working. Neither did two, three, four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> and so it, it was it, it must have been it must have been wonderful for him to play. He must have had so much fun with that. And um, you know, we don't have actors like Jack, uh, Jack Lemon around. Uh, and he's he's got a great he's got with, with you know, I think I actually think, you know, I think Steve Carell is a bit close, you know, in that way of kind of of kind of putting 
uh, the dr- the drama and, and the comedy that kind of, that that marriage. I think he's kind of close to that. But that, I mean, no one is Jack Lemmon, and and, and the cinephiles everywhere. Uh, uh, I would advise actors everywhere. I would advise to um, watch his filmography because it's Don he's your, an incredible Don your OCD actor. Capped, hit IMDb. Find yes, out where exactly. He went. <laughs> exactly exactly and we haven't even talked about how like that dialogue is so difficult and these guys just breeze through it like like the breeze. like the heavyweight fighters you, you say they are you know? it's just great yeah yeah and, they, they and james foley what a run back then i mean at close range run. and after dark my sweet and um, and glengarry glenn glock glengarry glenn ross alone is like a great triple feature for any director right mm-hmm. uh well that wraps this uh tmg interview follow us on twitter at the movie guys uh, on facebook as well and youtube instagram itunes so you get your daily dose of uh, jokes articles or thank you david for you appreciate it uh road oh, it was great great talking to you man thank yeah. you so much june 4th you'll get roadhead everywhere vod is i mean i'm assuming it's all the usual places at your itunes your amazon your, your voodoo what have you right right um and as ever you can find everything we're up to including reviews articles and more interviews like this one and our recent of podcast appearances adam Witt and myself have been all over the place talking about movies lately you can find it at themovieguys.net all right thank you david thanks paul